afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Livestock products are an important part of Vermont's agricultural economy. So this afternoon we're going to learn about livestock in Vermont from the state's new diversified livestock expert. Joining me is Joe Emenheiser, who was recently hired as a diversified livestock specialist with UVM Extension. Welcome. It's nice to have you with us. Good to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about your new position. As you said, I'm, I'm the Diversified Livestock Specialist for the state. I work out of the St. Albans office. Uh, my, my job is to work primarily with producers to help improve their efficiency, their marketing, um, and just try to build viable systems. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about livestock, you obviously think about dairy when you're in Vermont. Right, right. I think milk receipts are 70 or 70 percent of the ag income in the state. and. So diversified livestock is, is really anything but dairy cows or horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have all these, all these different critters from beef cows to sheep to poultry to pigs that, that provide a, a, a huge variety of products. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the things that people should be thinking about when they're thinking about maybe I'll get into the hog industry, or maybe I'll, I'll have some, some goats? What are some of the things that, that farmers should think about when they think about diversification? Well, there's, I mean, there's a couple different approaches to, to diversification, and that's, that's an interesting part of this role because, uh, I mean, we do have a pretty heavy dairy emphasis, and some, some dairy producers are looking to diversify their, their enterprises just to have different markets or to, uh, uh, to, to help have products available throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, a, big the, the, a big problem though can be how to do it and how to do it most cost effectively. Ab absolutely. Um, and, and so one of the big challenges that we're facing with, with livestock producers is they're trying to find that magic point in, in size and scale that, that works for, for them. They're trying to increase numbers to produce more product, but uh, but not sure where that magic number is that, that works for them. And of course, there are a lot of things that have to go into that thought. Land would be one thing. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. What's their farm look like and what can it support? Right. And so what makes this system work for Vermont? Well, it's... In, in, in production agriculture, sometimes we think too much about uh, just producing the product and just that part of, of, the, uh, of the process, but it's really... It's really a greater community, and so uh, yes, we have the land and we have you know, the soil, the plants, the animals, the interactions there, but, but then there's the product and the interaction of that with, with the greater community and uh, all those different feedback channels, that, that's, that's a viable system. And also, too, there are a lot of government changes that are taking effect, too. Yep, yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, certainly, it, um, from an environmental standpoint, there's a lot of things that are shifting. There's a lot of uh, legislation on the books that can, can will have some important impacts on livestock producers in the future. And so, trying to uh, be proactive and stay ahead of the ball there, uh, making sure that that the production systems that we have are responsible for the environment. Then there's also the animal welfare side, and uh, it's very important. And, and I think farmers are committed to providing to the welfare of the animals, but uh, keeping keeping abreast of the legislation there is is an important challenge that we'll face. Now, Vermont is really active as far as the farm to plate movement and, and people are really concerned about where their food is coming from. What are some of the things that producers should keep in mind in light of that? Because we want to talk about food systems and so you, know, you were talking about the environment and what the animals are eating, but also too, I would imagine it all has to, to come around to how it's presented to the public as far as the final product. Oh, oh, absolutely. I'm, um, so, so again, it's it's one big system, and there there are uh, there's a great community. Uh, in, in Vermont that's very interested in, in what they eat and, and what they have and uh, the products that are available to them. And so these, these farm to plate programs take that big picture into mind and uh, th there will be an important diversified livestock component of that. And so what about your own background? Did you grow up on a farm? I did, I did. Um, in, in York County, Pennsylvania, um, 
my parents were both teachers. I had three younger brothers, and we uh, essentially grew the food for our own table, uh, which is a pretty similar model to a lot of the places here in Vermont. Um, that background kind of stayed with me, and I got active in 4-H and, and livestock judging, meats judging. Uh, went off to Oklahoma State for, uh, for undergraduate and uh, was pretty active in, in livestock and meats judging there as well. Um, a lot of emphasis on, on beef cattle there and, uh, and specialized mostly in livestock merchandising. And I went to um, upstate New York. I managed a sheep farm there that sold meats into restaurants in Manhattan uh, for a while. Moved back to Pennsylvania and I, I worked as a butcher for a while. Uh, then started graduate school at Virginia Tech. Um, worked there mostly on uh, genetic improvement of, of sheep, uh, using ultrasound for uh, measuring sheep meat component traits. Um, from that point, I then bounced back up to New York to a different, different farm. Ended up managing 2,300 ewes near, near Rochester for a while. Uh, and then I started my, my PhD dissertation work at Virginia Tech uh, on, a, on a beef cattle systems project. So it's, I bounced around quite a bit to get to this point. That's a pretty diverse background. What are some of the things that you learned? Well, I think, I think the most important thing that I learned from that, in, in addition to the systems approach that we've talked about, is, is that product has to come first. And so focusing on what it is that's desired by customers and how to measure it, how to improve it, and how to develop systems that, that provide it at a cost that they can afford and uh, you know, throughout the year when, when they need it. And you, you have noticed in, in your notes that you wrote that too often we focus on marketing. What, what's the difference between focusing on marketing, marketing versus focusing on the product? Well, I mean, both, both production and marketing are important, but I think sometimes a trap that, that farmers can fall into is, is marketing what they produce rather than producing what, what they market. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think it's very important to first define your goals and, and in some ways work from back to front on, on that approach. We'll make sure that there's going to be a demand for what you're producing. Absolutely. Yep. And so um, earlier you mentioned ultrasound. How does that work? It's, it's a pretty neat uh, technology because it, it allows us to measure meat traits in animals that are still alive. And so from a, from a genetic standpoint, that can, uh, that can allow us to make genetic change for those traits uh, and get a whole lot more information. Um, ultrasound is uh, a technology that uses high, uh, high frequency sound waves mm -hmm. to, and uh, And that gives, shows the image. I mean, we see it here now. There's obviously the animal is, is over to your left. Yep, yep. There's a, there's a cow in a chute there, and I've got uh, a transducer in my hand that I put on the animal, uh, and it reports an image back to the screen. Animal is made up of tissues of all different densities, and mm -hmm. so between fat and muscle and bone, uh, when those sound waves encounter tissues of different density, it, it reports a different brightness on the screen, and that allows us to, to so, measure those traits. So you can see, traits. like here, here's an example yep. of, obviously there's a carcass on the left, but that the ultrasound on a live animal on the right, and you can see the same thing without having to, to slaughter the animal exactly, first. Exactly, exactly. It, it's really difficult for an animal to reproduce after it you know, gets to the, <laughs> to the meat cooler. Right. Um, and, and so in, in this image, uh, you know, I have a, a blue line there that shows back fat thickness, a red uh, oval type shape that, that's the outline of the loin eye area, and mm -hmm. those are two important traits to, uh, to, to improve lean yield in lambs. And so with this information, then what does a farmer do? Once it can see this animal has this particular trait, it's something that maybe is desirable, so you want to keep that animal for a breeding stock? Right, and so, I mean, in, in the lamb context, for example, there's a lot of uh, push, consumer pushback against lambs that are overly fat, and so oh, okay. a farmer can... I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, uh, a farmer can take the information on you know, back fat thickness in the lambs, um, they can use that information to select which ones to keep for breeding and, and continue to make genetic progress in leanness, 
It also has, uh, not so much in lambs, but in cattle, uh, we have the ability to take a group of animals that are nearly, nearly ready mm -hmm. and measure them to decide which will, will offer the most optimal product. And maybe if they're not quite ready, they need a little bit more time on feed. Well, that could really save a far farmer some money. I mean, if you can get more money for an optimal animal, then you can have the luxury of time to wait and, and fatten it up. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And so do you see this use of ultrasound to be able to work in Vermont? I, I think it's a pretty important tool. Um, I think that, uh, like we just said, from the genetic side or, or the, the market readiness side, uh, there's a lot of progress that can be made. Um, one of the things that where it could work really well is in, in trying to network producers and uh, pull products together so that we can hit larger regional markets. Mm -hmm. That's a fair and objective way to assess whose animals are, are ready and um, it, it fits that niche pretty well. And one of the things that I know of covering um, this issue is there's been a real problem, not problem, but a lack of slaughter facilities. It's, it's a big bottleneck. I know from uh, both farms that I've managed in New York, uh, that, that was our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And we could do everything that we wanted to do on the production side. We could do all the consumer networking that we, that we needed to. Uh, but in the middle, if there wasn't a way to, uh, process to turn, the process the, the animal into a product, it, it, it set us back. That's something called seasonality. Can you explain to folks what that means? Well, and, and so what, what I was going to say is from, from the other side, uh, from my experience as a butcher, I realize why it's so challenging to have a lot of slaughterhouses because there's a, there's a point in the year, in the spring, when nobody has anything ready. Right. And, and if you can't keep running throughout the year, it's very difficult to... Uh, because it's obviously farmers are raising animals. They're born in the late winter, early spring. They grow all summer long, eating grass and so forth, and then they're ready for slaughter usually in the fall. So if everybody's on that same schedule, right. no one's, the slaughterhouses are waiting for several months, and then boom, they get slammed. Yep, yep. And so how do you get around that? Well, there's, um, th there are a couple different ways to alter uh, you know, how animals are born throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, like, like I said, I think one of the most important things we need to do is networking between producers to, uh, to coordinate that availability. And, and as long as we have cooperation and we have fair and objective ways to, you know, to decide who is going to be marketing at what time, uh, that overcomes some of that problem. And then we can, we can provide the the volume that the slaughterhouses need to operate. And so do you think that because Vermont is sort of a smaller, more tight-knit community, that's going to be easier to do than if you were working in a larger realm? I, I do. Um, one of the things that, that's been so great since I've gotten here is just how engaged uh, everyone is. And, and there's, there's a collective goal to get this done. So uh, I, I think that we'll be able to, to pull it together. And so, what are some of the things that you'll be doing in this new role as diversified livestock specialist with UVM Extension? The, the primary role will be working with, with producers and um, you know, helping them through their, their questions just about animal health or reproduction mm -hmm. or nutrition, uh, but then also focusing on the marketing side and uh, trying to make sure that we are, are making available the products that, that Vermonters are, are wanting. And so if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? I have an 800 number that's uh, scrolling across the screen right now, mm -hmm. which is 800-639-2130. Uh, and I think my email address is there as well, which is just my first and last name. Mm -hmm. well, terrific. I want to thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's an interesting, interesting field you're in. <laughs> That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.